So we're going to talk about um, statement of work and that you shouldn't do anything without it. And first I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the Media Temple WordPress evangelist. I was born in Hollywood. I'm a California native. I've always lived in California. This is my 11th word camp and I'm speaking at 12 word camps this year, which is a lot of fun. I'm a regular contributor on WP Water Cooler, which is a great show. If you haven't seen it, it's a weekly podcast. And there's about five of us, and we have guests on, and we talk about WordPress. And it's a little bit about, a little bit between Seinfeld and The View. We're kind of opinionated and silly. Um, so it's a fun show. It's been running for a little over a year, and we have 3.5 million views on Water Cooler. So you can see all the shows archived on YouTube, or go to WPWaterCooler.com. I've also hosted DragCast episode 17, which is another WordPress blog podcast. Um, that was a lot of fun to do with um, Dre Armada and Brad Williams. They're awesome. And I blog sometimes at suzettefriend.com. I used to blog a lot regularly, but I've been kind of busy, so I haven't been blogging so much. And all of these slides will be on speaker deck. Um, I just have to upload them. They're not quite there yet, but they will be there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my web experience. So I love code. That's my thing. I've been coding for over 19 years, um, back when there was no CSS, when we used tables and font tags, and it was really disgusting, but now I've upgraded my skills so I don't code in, in tables anymore, thank goodness. I freelanced for five years on my own. Um, I also, after that, I worked at a WordPress development shop for three years, where I built over 200 WordPress websites. And the reason that I'm talking about statement of work today is because we never, ever used one. We didn't use contracts. We didn't use anything. And eventually, that development shop went under because they couldn't support. They weren't charging enough for what they were doing. Um, they would charge $500 for a custom WordPress theme site with advanced functionality. And they did this continuously. And I told them, this is taking a lot more hours than you are telling people that it's taking. So they went under. So after that, um, I went to work. I saw a job listing for a media, uh, WordPress evangelist, and I said, what is that? I need to be that. So that was that media temple. And basically what I do, this is a question I get asked most, like what does a WordPress evangelist do? So I tend, it's, it's different for everybody, and DreamHost has Mika and Mike Shredder, and they do a lot of with contribution, which I'd like to get into. Um, but for now, I attend... Um, two to three WordPress meetups a week. I'm lucky because in Southern California there's 19 different WordPress meetup groups. So I have a choice and I go anywhere from San Diego to Ventura, which is a range of about 200 miles in the Southern California region. Um, I run a meetup called WordPress for Artists where I teach non-coders and non-web people how to build a web website in WordPress. And I also write tutorials for the Media Temple blogs, like internally and externally. I've written uh, articles on Jetpack and new features that have come out in 3.6, but that was a while ago. And I speak at WordPress and conferences as well, as I was saying. And I consult on internal products and, and blogs that we're going to create internally at Media Temple as well. And I also co-organized um, the Southern California WordPress 10th anniversary party which I did with a lot of the people from the water cooler. And it was the largest party, and it was featured on Matt's State of the WordPress. We had a pinata. That was us. That was a lot of fun. So I, I love doing that. I love working with people and teaching them about WordPress. So now, the agenda that we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about what a statement of work is, why you would want to use it, when you would want to have one, and we're also going to talk about the five components to a statement of work to make sure that we cover all bases. Um, so the problem, the main problem, when I first gave this talk, it was more about scope creep. And what scope creep is, is when additional features that are not budgeted for cause you to go over the allocation for your project. So you're essentially working for free at this point. Um, so you don't want that to happen. So statement of work is one way that you can kind of guard against having things come up that are outside of the original project. So that's the main reason for scope for a statement of work. And when you have this, you have prof your profits go down, your loss goes up. Also, there's like miscommunications, 
there's bad feelings, unhappy face. Your reputation may suffer when, when there's miscommunications. Um, you will, there's also missed opportunities. And a failed plan is basically a plan to fail. So if you're not planning ahead of exactly what you're going to be doing for the client and doing that, then you're going to go over and it's going to fail. The whole project's going to fail just like it did at that development company that I worked at. Um, the worst thing that could happen is that you could actually be taken to court over, especially over e-commerce sites, if they're not up and running yet by a certain time. If your client is litigious, you could be in a lot of trouble that way. So you try to avoid that. <laughs> so why does this happen? Most of all, it happens because the client doesn't really know what they're asking when they ask for something. I once had a client, I finished their website and I built the whole website, it was all complete. And they said, yeah, I'd like to see that 75% smaller, the whole site, which is a printing thing. Um, it doesn't really apply to the web. There's no way to reduce the page size by 75%. So I think I had her do control minus, and that worked for her. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of times they may not know that you have to rewrite the entire page from scratch and redo all the graphics, and you, it's just a matter of education. It's just a matter of letting them know what needs to be done. There's not a magic button to reduce or enlarge a web page, but it has to be rewritten. Um, and you, the thing is, you really want to make the client happy. And, and this is kind of where a lot of the scope creep comes from, just people pleasing. You want to make them happy, but you have to determine if that's something that goes outside of the original scope, because they will take advantage of you if they can. And they will, not intentionally, um, but it's just kind of like what happens, it's the nature, they see something cool that they want on their website, they're like, hey, can you put this blinky box on here? And you're like, well, that's a little bit extra, um, and they don't seem to understand that. So what happens is when you want to make the client happy, you make exceptions for them, and you might answer an email at 2 a.m. on a Saturday, but all of a sudden, now because you've answered that email for them at 2 a.m., they're all like, well, wow, my web person is available all the time. I can just ask them whatever I want, whenever I want, and expect them to answer. So a good thing is scheduling your mail ahead of time, and if people email you on the weekend to set that to go out on Monday morning. So they don't think that you're just waiting for their, for their emails. Um, so it's all about setting the client expectation. If you set it at a very high level, where you're going above and beyond all the time at the very beginning, their expectation is going to be set at that level. They're going to expect you to be available on weekends. They're going to expect you to answer all of their training questions. And you just have to let them know that that's not really what you're doing, unless that's, that is what you're doing. Um, but usually most developers like to hand the training off to someone else or um, have them take a class or something. <laughs> so what do you do in this situation? Um, help. <laughs> So the solution that I found is to write a statement of work, which is a true universal euphonious thing, as Jeremy would say. Um, it's originally used, where it came from, it was originally used in government contracts, and it's a lot of legal blah blah. But I found that you don't quite need that level of detail, unless it is a very large client, then you might need a lawyer. Uh, but in most cases, just using it without a lawyer is, is sufficient. So it's more, the statement of work I'm talking about, it's more informal, it's, it's not a legal binding document. It's just something to kind of outline all the expectations of um, your customer, what they can expect from you, the turnaround times that they can expect from you, what, just everything that, what they can expect from you. So it clearly communicates all the expectations in black and white, so it's right there in front of them. You can also outline rules, milestones, and deadlines in this document. And I recommend not sticking to hard dates. I would recommend saying that, like, okay, after the design, it's going to take me one month to code this. And if you give them a timeline instead of a date, then they won't expect you, well, you said that was only going to take you 10 hours. It's been two days, you know, because sometimes there's time in between and you have other projects that you're working on as well. It also defines the terms of acceptance of a completion, which is important because you don't want your project to go on forever and ever and ever with no end in sight, and you're like, I just want to be done with this. So this will define exactly like, okay, your site is live, it's working, I've given you all the passwords, I've given you all the training, 
we're ready and I have showed you how to do up, um, maintenance, um, depending if the, you're doing that. Usually, I will not do maintenance for clients. So when you create a statement of work, I love this quote, ad hoc, ad hoc, and quid pro quo, so little time, so much to know. And that is so true of um, just doing web development in general, I think. But usually when you create a statement of work, look at at least spending two to three hours on it. You should document all functionality that is outside of the regular native WordPress functionality. So if you install a plugin, that's extra. If you have to do anything custom coding wise, that's extra. Everything is extra and should be documented. So you want to err on the side of clarity. So it's pretty much common sense, like whatever you think is going to be most clear to the customer is what you want to document. And it is, it is an investment on the project running smoothly. Like you wouldn't probably do this if you were just doing a one page website. But for most other websites, it doesn't have to be so detailed. It, it really depends on the size of the project. And use your best judgment. Um, just put yourself in the place of, of the client and think, well, would they understand this, not knowing web development or not knowing the background that I have? And if you're unsure, Google it. Google is a great resource. There's no way that you can ever know everything in the world, but you can know how to Google things. So get good at Googling. I mean, everything from law to development, everything can be found online. It's awesome. Now, you don't have to go to the library. <laughs> And use lawyers when necessary. If you're working on a $20,000 or maybe even a $10,000 job, you might want to use a lawyer for this. Um, it, it just really depends on, the, on the, how big that entire project is taking. So why do you want to use a statement of work? Basically to cover your own butt. <laughs> um, you want to cover your own butt. You want to make sure that you set the expectations at a certain level so that there is a clear understanding between you and the client of what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. You want to eliminate unpaid work hours. And this is important because I've done jobs where I actually gave them a free website when I figured out the hours. So you don't want to do that because you can't continue to sustain on that. Um, so you want to be sustainable. It also, when you write it correctly, it's a blueprint for your pro entire project. So the more time that you spend on planning, the, better, the smoother things are going to go. And I've worked both with a plan and without a plan, and it goes much better with a plan, for sure. And it also helps to budget your hours a little bit, so you can kind of see like, okay, this is a lot of redundant work, maybe I want to contract that out, but you get a bigger idea of the whole project. The alternative can be very costly. If somebody feels like suing you and they do, um, you don't want to have to go through that entire thing. Um, I've had people where I didn't, um, they wanted it done by a certain time, and I said that I couldn't deliver on that time, and they're all like, well, we already paid you, and we need it by this time, and we're going to sue you if you don't deliver. And um, people can be, I mean, maybe it's because it's California, I don't know. <laughs> they're a little bit more litigious out there. It also helps to outline responsibilities, like who does what, who's in charge of the hosting, and I think I list some of these things, but... Um, there's different things that you may come across or even different costs that you may come across as a result of doing a project. And you want to make sure that all of that is covered. It also will outline the contact methods and times. So you want to say like, okay, I'm not 24 seven and you want to tell this, this up front. So they just know that you work between these certain hours and if you're available on the weekend, maybe that's an extra charge. So you just want to make sure that that's clearly communicated up front. So if you work without a statement of work, you will have more than a big hole in your pocket. <laughs> you will have a negative hole in your pocket. And um, a lot of times when I'm doing a larger project, I find that I have a lot of friends. So I say use them. There are friends you might know, or just from going to a meetup, you might meet people. But people that specialize, you know, don't be afraid to outsource certain parts of your project to other people who are specialists in that area. That's only going to benefit the client in the end. Um, but project management is one area where you might need help with, especially if it's a larger project. Hosting is always an area, unless you are a hosting company. Um, security could be an issue. Um, if, you don't, if their site gets hacked, you don't know how to clean it, I recommend security. Um, they're awesome for that. 
There's also a ton of SEO and marketing specialists. So if you don't want to do SEO, usually what I'll do for clients is I'll give them the basic SEO, and then I'll say if you want extensive SEO, that requires a lot of research, and it is an ongoing thing that is always changing. And a lot of clients don't understand that, that SEO is kind of like an ongoing thing, as well as marketing. Graphic design and photographers. I think a website is basically um, as good as the photographs and the images that are used on there. So make sure that you're using images that are allowed to be used and that they're of good quality. I once had a, a client and they had they sold pies, so it was an e-commerce store, and they had the most horrible pictures of pies. They were like in the box, it was taken with an iPhone. And I'm like, you can't expect anyone to want to buy your expensive pies with that picture. And they just didn't get it, but it does make a huge difference. So they eventually folded it because nobody was buying their overpriced, ugly looking pies. <laughs> um, also, development and programming. If something is outside of what you normally do, don't be afraid to ask for help. I, there's a lot of resources out there online um, for people that will do development for you or more advanced things, or maybe you just need help building a plugin, or maybe you just need help with a small part of it. Don't be afraid to outsource those. And training and documentation is something that a lot of people don't think of outsourcing, but it's a good idea. There are actually um, a lot of people that specialize just in training and just in documentation. Sometimes it's together. But it's a definitely a component that you want to consider when you're doing your statement of work, unless they are like a WordPress expert, which they probably won't be. So they'll probably need some training. Also, updates and maintenance. They don't, now customers don't have to actually do their own updates and maintenance. There's services that will do it for you. You could get managed hosting that will handle everything for you. And there's also a service called Maintain with two ends at the end, maintain.com. And they, that's all they do is they just do updates and maintenance. So don't feel bad about like having to refer somebody else and they can contract through you or outside of you. So some collaboration tools that people want to use, or you should use when you're collaborating with a bunch of different people, is um, Google Apps is great. Like you can do collaborative documents where um, you're editing it real time, and I recommend that for everybody. Google Hangouts is also another free and awesome way to have like a face-to-face -face without being there. Um, and you can also do screen shares in Google Hangouts. There's also Skype video chat. Um, that's really great if you're not face-to-face. -face. Um, Asana is really awesome, and some people use Basecamp. I've used Basecamp in the past, and it's better than nothing, but um, I prefer Asana. And there's also um, what Automatic and, and WordPress.com uses is a P2 status blog, and that's just kind of like a blog that looks kind of like a Twitter feed, where you just update the status. So that's another option that you can use for kind of managing your product and updating everybody on status. And then there's old-fashioned paper and pencil, which is sometimes the best, especially if you want to sketch out a quick idea or something for your client or you want to have some kind of a visual rep representation for them. You can use just plain old pen paper and pencil or an iPad or whatever it is that you use, but just something that you can quickly sketch on for them. And I recommend doing that and then giving them a copy and keeping a copy for yourself when you do do that. So the implementation. Um, here's an example of what a sample workflow would look like when you use a statement of work, or at least this is how I envision it being. And um, because a statement of work is a lot of work, so there's a certain uh, time in the project where you want to do that. But the first step is going to be the discovery and acquisition. And this is not the discovery and acquisition of the assets. This is more deciding if this is a customer that you want to work with. It's very important that you're picky about who you work with. Um, nightmares can come out of working with bad people. Um, so there's a few different things that you can do to kind of vet people or red flags that will come up like when you're talking to them. Especially if they, they said like, oh, we had this problem with this other developer, and that might be a constant thing for them because they're not educated. They weren't educated in the correct way um, about their website. So in this discovery and acquisition phase, there's kind of like a rough quote, and there's also kind of a deposit and retainer. And I like to get that up front before doing 
the statement of work even, because the statement of work is an investment and it's part of the project. Um, so I don't like to do that work and then hand it over to them and they can take that anywhere they want. Um, usually that you don't want to do that. So you want to do, give them the statement of work a little bit later on in the project. <laughs> so after you've decided that you're going to take them on as a client, get your payment arrangements made, get your deposit. Um, typically, I usually work on a 50% up front, 50% on completion. I've heard of other people saying that, like, this is going to take a longer time, so I need to have maybe a fourth, like, every month, or however you want to break it down. Just make sure that you have some kind of payment in place. And that's important if you're working with friends and family especially. You just want to get that taken care of out front. The next thing would be the asset collection. And this is where, now you actually haven't met with a client yet. So I recommend before you meet with a client to get all of the assets, um, which are, oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. So the assets would be anything that you would need to create the website. That would be your logos, your colors, any, if they had a style guide, like a corporate style guide, you would get that as well. Um, anything that you're going to need to make the website. And I recommend that you collect all of those things before you actually meet with a client. Because if not, your client meeting kind of goes like, yeah, this would be cool, yeah, this would be cool, but you really don't have anything to work with. Um, so I recommend getting all that stuff up front before you even meet with a client, so that when you do meet with a client, you'll actually have something to talk about. You could say, well, I noticed your logo has these colors in it, or do you want to stick with a color scheme with these colors incorporated? Like, that gives you kind of a point of reference about things to talk about. So after the asset collection, after you've collected all the assets, um, depending what they are, then you have the client meeting. And this is where you talk about exactly, maybe you might use sketches and wireframes of um, ideas of what the website might look like. And you're basing it off the assets. And hopefully in the assets, sometimes there's content there, sometimes there's not. Um, but it's good to kind of think of your content when you're designing the page because you want to make sure that the content is going to work with whatever design you're choosing. So in the client meeting, you want to do just wireframes. And there's a, there's a gazillion tools that you can use for wireframing. I just like paper and pencil because it's just quick and simple and easy. Um, and there's also storyboards. And the storyboards, they can be kind of informal, but it's something that kind of tells you like what's gonna happen when you click on this button. Um, it more has to do with the functionality of the site rather than the look of the site. So the wireframe gives you a rough idea of what the site looks like, while the storyboard will tell you what actions are actually going to happen. After that, after you've met with a client and you have all of your assets, then you can actually create a statement of work or an SOW, the statement of work. So after you create the statement of work, they, you want to get the client to sign off on the statement of work and agree that, yes, this is what you're going to do, this is what you're going to pay, what we're going to pay for, and this is when you're going to have it done by. And so they'll accept it. And it's only after this acceptance of the statement of work when you actually start doing your actual work. Um, because a lot of, um, you will have gotten rid of a lot of problems before you even start. <laughs> I don't want to switch it because I see you're taking a picture. <laughs> Thanks. So like, we're going to talk a little bit more about the discovery and acquisition phase. The meanies are coming. Sometimes they can be meanies, but you want to say no often. Did you have a question? Establishing a cost. Oh, oh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the sweet spot between establishing an estimate and getting the comfortable client comfortable with moving forward and actually getting to a statement of work? Because usually I make my estimates be that all encompassing thing, mm -hmm. and I don't always land them as a client. And yeah. So I appreciate what you said, but sometimes I haven't really thought about how to position it with my clients that. Um, Yes, you're going to get a very um, rudimentary estimate, mm -hmm. you know, to save my time, but how to position it with them so that the conversation continues until I come up with that formal. 
Stage I would just let them make them aware of the entire process and let them know that you're going to give them a quote and it's going to be a rough estimate based on what you find and say that this is pretty close to what it's going to be, but additional things. And then once we get into it and I get to collect the assets and, and see what is actually there, then I'll be able to give you a more, more uh, specific work. But in order to give like a very specific quote, quote, you have to do a lot of work up front and I'm not willing to do that for free. And some people have a discovery fee, so it's kind of like, just, it kind of depends on how you want to handle that. But I just let them know that there's going to be discovery and that's going to be after the payment. And then after that, that's when I can give a very specific quote. Does that help a little bit? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I know, and I've, I've done it a lot. So you, the thing with um, discovery and acquisition that I found that you want to say no a lot. I know some developers, when they're brand new, they're all like, "Oh, you want a website? I'll give it to you." You know, like, and they're very enthusiastic and and very happy to help people. But they find out that this person isn't so good to work for, or they might be too demanding. So what I do is I'll say no often, especially if it's something that I feel I can't really add value to. Um, so Chris Lemma is awesome. He writes about WordPress and project management and high performance. And he says to say no often. And he has email templates to do this. Uh, just saying thank you. Thank you for your in inquiry. Um, I'm sure your, your project is going to be wonderful. But unfortunately, I'm going to have to say no at this time because I'm, I'm overcommitted or um, I don't think I can add value to your project. So it's, it's good to say no. And when you say no, you can accept better projects. You leave room for those better projects. I started out with a lot of crappy projects. Now I would have said no to all of them. Um, but that's hindsight. So Also, when you work with, with um, when you say no a lot and you only accept the better projects, you get to work with smart people. You don't want to work with the people that are don't know anything and are just like, very taxing on your time. You want to work with the smart people, so you want to make time for that. You know, you want to make sure that you have fun and learn. And that's, for me, that's kind of like my goal, besides making money, is just to have fun and learn while I'm doing the project. So I, I want to make sure that I have, find the right kind of projects to be with. And you want to be selective about who your clients are, because they're, they're picky about who you are. So why not be picky back? And it's really up to the developer whether they're going to take on that project. And the developer should be in control throughout the project. And do awesome work and give back. You know, whatever. I'm a big proponent of doing um, giving back, contribution, teaching other people that don't know as much as you, as much as you know, even if you don't know a lot. It's probably more than some people know. So, you know, help those other people along and do awesome work. Then, like I was saying before, you want to work out all payments beforehand because that can become a sore spot. And I've done work where I've waited to get paid and waited to get paid, and I started developing a resentment. And then when you develop a resentment, you really don't want to do the work or you're not doing as good of work for the client. So you just want to make sure that's all taken care of up front. So the asset collection, let's talk a little bit about more, that more. So you want to collect all the things. And I recommend getting this before you start working, before the statement of work. Um, microphone? Somebody has a question. <laughs> oh, thank you. Just on the last stuff you were talking about, what if they don't pay or they delay? Because then I don't work. Can I don't you make work. that clear up front? Yes. You can let them know that if I don't get the payment, work doesn't start. Or if the payment is delayed, that's going to have a ripple effect on everything. So they need to get you that payment when you say. Otherwise, you, don't, you can't start work. And if they want to pressure you, that to me is a red flag. Maybe I shouldn't work with these people. If they want me to do work, they're all like, yeah, well, we need this website up by Monday. And they're like, well, I need to do payment first, and I need to build a statement of work, and that all takes time. They're all like, well, we don't have that kind of time. We're, we're having an event on Monday, and it needs to be up by then. That is a red flag. I probably don't want to do business with them at all. So that's, that's kind of a good way to bet them out. Do you ever just ask, well, I need cash right now if you want it for Mondays? Um, yeah, no, I do. I go, well, you need to take care of the payment before I can start work on this. 
And if I get any pushback at all, and I still want to continue to work with that client, I'll say, you know, I have other people that I'm doing work with, and they've already paid me, so I need to put them ahead of you. And I'll even use that as a bargaining tool to get a higher price. Say, I, we're doing this work at this rate for these people. I can't go lower than that because it wouldn't make financial sense for me to do that. So I'll, I'll kind of use that as a chip. And, and you're holding the card, so it's really up to you whether you want to start working without a payment or not. But I recommend it highly against it because it can become a problem. They say, like, oh, well, it has to be approved through such and such. And especially when you're working with larger companies, you just, they have to figure it out because you won't start working with them. And then if it's a problem in a huge like approval process to get the payment or they say like net 30, say, well, I'm sorry, I can't start till that. And if they still insist, I, I would just say very politely, well, I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to continue, to continue this project with you. You might have to find a different developer that can address your needs. You know, and I think probably that is like the biggest red flag if they're not willing to work with you that way. So before you start the statement of work and after you get the payment, I recommend that you have all this information up front because if you don't, it's really frustrating to get it when your project is done and you want it to go live, the customer wants it to go live, and you're waiting on hosting information or DNS info. You're going to need both of these things to put their site live unless you're not, unless you're just handing it to them on a zip disk to put it, or a zip disk. <laughs> you got a floppy. Yeah, floppy. Five and a quarter floppy. Um, but you want to make sure you have that information so that when you're ready to go live, that you have all of that information that you need. And sometimes clients don't understand this. They don't understand hosting. They don't understand DNS or how it works or domain names. So it's kind of your job to help them out a little bit with that and just let them know that you need this information up front. Um, also, you, if there's a style guide, you want to make sure you get that. And it, usually larger companies will have a style guide. If they don't have a style guide, that's okay. Pretty much all the style guide can, contains is um, what colors you're going to use like specifically and what fonts you're going to use specifically. So if you don't have a style guide, this is something you want to work out with a client. Like, what is your color scheme? What are the fonts that you're going to want to use? And you want to get all that approved on. And a good way to do that is you can give them, instead of giving them a full mock-up of the site, is to use style tells, which will give them kind of a preview of what the fonts will look like and what the color scheme will look like. Um, so that's another way to handle that. You'll also need the logo, of course, and a site map. And the site map is, is pretty much mandatory, but it doesn't need to be anything fancy. It could be a Word document, just labeling the structure of the pages, like under this page, we have these pages, and it just, it could be fancier, like um, like a site map, kind of like this, or, or it could just be words. As long as you know, like, what pages are supposed to show up on the front page, and what pages go underneath, and the structure of the site. And this is something you want to work out before. So after you have those things, um, then you want to have the client meeting, because you actually have something to talk about not just like all these things they'd like to see happen, but you can actually decide if this, if you need more stuff or if this is gonna be sufficient to create your statement of work. So here, by this time, after you meet with a client, I recommend that it's face-to-face -face if possible. If not, you can do one of the screen shares, um, but something where you can get in front of the customer, do sketches, do storyboards um, a little bit with them and kind of talk about the look and the functionality of the site. So once you have that, you should have a pretty good idea of what goes in the statement of work. Oh, this is about the client meeting. All together now. Yeah, so face-to-face -face if possible, use the screen shares. Um, Old-fashioned pen and paper seems to work great. And uh, it's important to document all special functionality. And you'll have to know a little bit about WordPress really before you can determine like what is native functionality and what is like special or what needs to be uh, programmed or customized for them. So in your job during this phase is kind of to help the client organize their information into how they're going to want it to look and to create an objective for their website. Like what is the ultimate goal of their website? And what do they want to do with their website? Is it for sales? Is it just to say you have a website? Or is it for clients to find you? Um, are they going to, what information are they going to be looking for there? So the statement of work, 
there's five parts that I've, I've pretty much, I've done some research and found pretty much um, that they contain mostly the certain things, but the first thing it's going to contain is the objectives, and that is the purpose of the website. And the second is going to be the actual tasks. And I find the tasks are kind of like lengthy because depending on how big your site is, this may be very huge. Um, also the timeline. And I recommend kind of putting the tasks like into little chunks where you can kind of group them together. And on the major task, kind of putting a timeline saying like this part will take, it'll take me, you know, like two weeks to build out the theme and it will take me another two weeks to build out the special functionality or to get the plugins all in there and stuff, but just some kind of a general guideline. I, I recommend against putting hard dates um, because then if there's a delay in one of the areas, it can kind of roll off the other ones. Also, you want to put your price and I recommend for me, at least, I don't break out the price because people get really nitpicky when they see line items with prices next to it. Because they'll go like, oh, well, we don't need that. You know, just take that out. And it, you know that you put it there for a reason. It's necessary for the project. And um, so I give them one lump sum, pretty much, when I get it. And um, I don't break it out for them at all. Even if they ask for it? If they ask for it, I'll put it as in general terms as they want, as, as, as general as I can get, but not anything specific. <laughs> yes? I find on the opposite that if you set the price, nothing is like out of... Yeah, I, I find that if you actually detail the price, there is a, an advantage, because otherwise it, it could look like a very expensive website, when in fact, they can, if they see how many tasks, well, you're still and they, see, list. It, it, they really see that, well, you know, nothing is, is seems expensive. It's just there are a lot of things that needs to get done. Yeah, they're still going to be able to see all of what it takes to put in there. So you're still detailing that part of it, but you're not breaking those items down into price. So they're just still going to see that it is a lot of work um, if you do it right. And, but they're not going to be able to see that like, okay, if I do SEO for you, that's another $500. Or if I add this page, like each page, like I recommend against putting like a price on a page. Like some people, how much is it per page? And, and that's ridiculous because you never know. It could be a static HTML page or it could be something that's like a buddy press or it could be something that's like a whole application in itself. So I really don't go by pages. And I try not to go by hours. Yeah, the counter argument is that I have a client, for example, and most of their website is like 15 pages. And now I have to do a website that is going to be like 75 pages. And if, if for a lump sum, they are going to say, well, you know, like this is a really expensive compared to the other one. It's like, uh, yeah, you have like four times, five times the number of pages. So, yeah, I think that an advantage to give them that, that inf information so that they don't compare orange, the apples to orange. Yeah, it's going to depend on your client as well and, and how much you can work with them and how much detail they need. Um, so it's, it's going to be different on a case-by-case -case basis always. So the objective. So what is your purpose? This is the most important part to kind of like get your head around this and remember it. Um, Pretty much you want to, in, in my last talk, I, I pretty much say this like at every talk I give, um, your objectives are your most important thing because you want to make sure that you, who is your intended audience? Who are you trying to reach? Um, how will they use the site? Are they going to be using it on mobile? What are they going to be looking for? Um, when, where will they use the site? Are they going to be looking for it while they're on the road on their mobile phone? Are they going to be looking at it more in depth like on a desktop? It might depend on what, what kind of um, website you're doing or for what kind of business you're doing a website for. Um, what information are they going to need? The information that they need on a desktop might be very detailed. They might want to see everything very detailed. But on the mobile, they might only want to know, like, where are you located at? Or what is your phone number? Or how can they get the quick information? So kind of tailoring that information towards the device. And somebody gave a talk about that here also, which is, is an awesome idea, but you should try to tailor it towards your audience as much as possible. Here comes the microphone. Hi. 
How do you get that information? Do they know that? Can they tell you? Or do you have to research this? How do you know what your target audience is? Well, you'll, you might have to do some market research. You can, if there's no place to start, I would recommend going with one of the competitors and seeing what they have, the kind of information that their competitors have, what their competitors are doing, and how much research you do will depend on the specific client. But if you have nowhere to start from, I would, I would recommend going to one of their competitors and looking just to get a feel for like the kind of information that's presented or how could you do this better. And that will give you an advantage actually if you do that kind of market research. And then if you're lucky enough, you can also look at analytics. If, if they had a previous website and there's some history, you might be able to look at analytics and do some querying of that information as well. So the other thing you, you definitely want to think of when you're coming up with your objective is what does success look like? How do you know when you have a successful website? Is it when the site is launched and ready? Is it when the site is launched and you're getting like, say, five customers per week? But the more specific about what you look like, success looks like, the more present it's going to be in your mind and the more likely that it's going to happen. So you want to define like what does success look like for you. If you're a designer, maybe that is a completed mock-up. Maybe that's what success looks like for you. So you kind of have to determine on, on your, based on your role as well as the, the, the individual project there. So you never want to forget who you're building the website for, um, which is actually not your client, but your client's client. So that's very important. Your client's client is the client, not your client, if that makes sense. It's a little bit meta. But basically, you want to help bring the best business to your client, and that involves serving their client. So you kind of have to have that in the back of your mind throughout the process. The next part is a task. And this is going to be the most tedious part of the whole process, I think. But you want to be very succinct, very short and brief as possible, but while showing everybody um, what is going to happen exactly. You want to avoid, definitely avoid the use of technical jargon and acronyms because you're dealing with somebody that doesn't know the web like you know it. Um, they may not know it. So you want to explain everything pretty much in like fifth grade terms or third grade terms. Um, just so it's very clear. You want to elaborate on features and functionality versus hours. And I think this is just a better thing to do because it's hard to sometimes know how much time it's going to take to do certain features. You could run into problems. So I'd say like, oh, okay, you want a store. You want the ability for your customers to buy things. Um, that I would, I would quote that as a functionality and not like, oh, that's going to take 20 hours to build. Because you don't always know. Oh, am I almost done? Do I have any time at all? Not really. <laughs> Not really. Okay, let's see if we can go through this. I do have these online. There's actually quite a lot left. That book isn't right, is it? No, it's now. It's wrong. <laughs> oh, I am. Okay, so I will have these slides online at speakerdeck.com. I'll go through it really quick here. But it goes through like some of the other things that you'll need. Do it. And I'm sorry, I didn't. What I gave this talk before, it went a lot faster. I think maybe more questions and more discussion. So I apologize for that. Um, but after you do your statement of work, you do want to get an acceptance of that statement of work after you've defined everything that needs to go on in the project. You want them to get them to somehow sign off on that. Um, I'm so sorry. Look, there is a lot of stuff left. <laughs> The resources. These are actually great resources and they'll be online. Um, but some of those have some great just general um, tips for writing a statement of work. Communication is key. Set your expectations up front. Be transparent. Clear is the best color. A happy client is a happy freelancer. Get paid for your awesome work and stand up for yourself always. Thank you very much.